So tonight, uh, this is a treat to see uh, here David in his, his new graphic novel. Um, it's brilliant. Uh, I expect nothing less from him to put all the pressure on him right now. <laughs> but please join me in welcoming Mr. David Small. Folks, it's National Geographic Night. <laughs> about all the things that are. <laughs> um, here's the way it's going to go tonight. Um, I'm going to show you a 10 minute film Despite that was made for um, me, actually, to do a reading because there's absolutely no way to do a reading of a practically wordless graphic novel. So um, I have this wonderful friend from, he's, he's American, but he works down in New Zealand, who made the film for Stitches, and he agreed to make the film for this book too. And um, <clears throat> oh it's just, got to go, go back. Yeah, I got it. Got it? Uh, so then I'm going to make some remarks for maybe 15 minutes and then open it up to your questions and my answers and realize even if you haven't read the book, we can talk about anything you want. Ask me anything you're curious about at all. So uh, with, with no, uh, no further ado, let's have the lights down. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by the choir. And folks dressed up like Eskimos. Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe. To make the season bright, tiny little tots with their eyes all aglow. That night, when the screaming and shouting began. It was like hearing my parents' real voices for the first time. I am sick. I am so tired. That summer, Mom ran away with Ollie Jackson, known on the football field as Action Jackson, Dad's best friend. Dad decided to move us to California. After his stint in the Korean War, then the divorce, I guess all he could think of was that dream of sun, sand, and golden bodies. He had an older sister in Pasadena, my Aunt June, whom I had never met. We would live with her until he found a job, he told me. It was all arranged, he said.
Hey, Dad, there's a puppy. The answer is no. But he might starve. Don't touch it. It probably has rabies. Maybe you can have a dog when we get to California. Hi, June. It's me. We just got in. Is it too late to come over? That's right, we. Russell is with me. My son? Your nephew? I told you I was bringing him with me. How old is he? Hey, Russell, how old are you? I'm 13. He's 13. Okay, fine. We'll discuss it tomorrow. Holy crap, is this where we're gonna live? Watch your mouth. You can't say things like holy crap around Aunt June. Don't you have a handkerchief, young man? June, my compensation has nearly run out, but I'll start looking for work right away. And when I get a job, I can get a loan on the GI Bill and get a house. We'll be out of your hair in no time. Mike, you won't be in my hair. You won't be staying here. This is Southern California. Real estate is going nuts. Mike, let's face it, you can't afford to live here. You need to go north, around San Francisco. That's where all the jobs are. Dad stopped coming home. I started to avoid Kurt and Willie and spent the empty hours in the empty house. Mrs. Ma's food still appeared on the doorstep every evening like magic. I learned to eat cold fish and rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner.
dad had not paid the electric bill. The water was turned off. The telephone line was dead. Nights I lay awake, listening for the sound of dad's car in the driveway. It's a comedy, of course. <laughs> um, just a few words about the origins of the story and uh, a little bit about the production or the making of it. And uh, um, it all started back in 2015 up in, in uh, this little mountain town in Mexico where Sarah and I have wintered for almost every winter for the last 25 years. San Miguel de Allende. Please don't go there. It's been found. <laughs> There's too many damn tourists. Uh, but we still like to go. And I have a, I have a best friend down there. Uh, his name is Mike. Um, we've known him for, what, Sarah? It's been like 20 years. Um, and Mike and I, when I'm down there in the winter, have a habit of meeting every weekday morning uh, at a little coffee joint down in the Calle Soyano. Uh, we have breakfast, or not breakfast, we have coffee. And he goes off to his Spanish class. And uh, Mike is a great guy. Um, I don't know if I would have ever talked to him if, if we hadn't been in this small town and run into one another every day. But, um, uh, and I say that because he's very different from, from me. Uh, Mike and I are exactly the same age, um, but we come from very different backgrounds. Um, he grew up in uh, then rural Marin County, California. Very, very different from the, rural, the Marin County of today, which is very shishy and overcrowded. But then it was pretty much a marsh with a couple of small towns scattered through it. And uh, I grew up in Detroit, opposite end of the country. And uh, Mike is, um, he's, uh, his personality is, I would describe as ebullient. He's, uh, he's a happy guy, even though he's an ex-alcoholic and uh, had some rough times in his life. He's, uh, he's basically um, optimistic, he's very funny, and he's a great raconteur. Um, ever since I was 15 and lost my voice in a surgery, uh, I've picked my friends for their volubility, for one thing. Uh, intelligence helps and wit, you know, stuff like that. But. Um, Mike's one of those people who can talk endlessly, and I just don't ever get bored of his stories. And this one morning um, at uh, La Ventana, he was, uh, he started, I don't know why, he started telling me stories about his youth back in California when he was uh, 12, 13, 14. And especially about this one summer when he was 13, when he uh, hung out with these two buddies of his. Uh, all of them completely free of parental influence. Um, they built a treehouse in the woods. Um, they did guy things in the treehouse. They smoked their first cigarettes, got drunk for the first time, uh, 
made endless speculations about sex, of course, and used to make forays down to the local soda joint on the highway to watch the other teens to see what lay in their future. And every day they would play games in this junk-filled gully. And I, I was listening um, with interest, but also with a certain degree of envy. Because to me, these stories were, they had a kind of a legendary Huck Finn kind of quality. Um, and so different from the way my adolescence went. Uh, totally restricted and uh, living in this kind of Soviet regime that was my parents' household. Um, and I wanted to be that, I wanted to have been that kind of boy. I wanted to have had that kind of life, doing those kinds of things. Uh, so I sort of listened to his stories with a mixture of envy and, and ennui. And, uh, but when a, uh, when a little psychopath came into the story, my ears perked up like a dog's. Because um, who's not interested in psychopaths, right? Uh, and uh, so there was this kid in Mike's town, um, call him Benny, uh, who liked killing small animals in macabre, gruesome ways. And uh, I think everybody in town suspected Benny. He was a loner kid, um, a very strange, silent type. Uh, but nobody had any proof. Uh, and he used to hang around the edges of, of my friend Mike's um, Group their little their little uh, garrison there and uh, he it was as if he wanted to be part of them but they didn't want anything to do with him especially after they got proof that he was the killer and so when they caught him alone one day they beat the crap out of him or one of them did it wasn't Mike but Mike sat by and watched and that was basically the end of my friend's stories except for the fact that he was raised a good Catholic. He has a good conscience. And it's bothered him all of his life, wondering if they had done what they had done. If I think he knew they hadn't done the right thing. It certainly wasn't going to change a kid like that. Um, but I think in the back of his mind, he always wondered if he would run into him again, uh, if he would. Uh, um, go on to make headlines if he would end up in San Quentin prison, if, uh, or if he would end up in high political office. <laughs> These people can go many ways, you know, as we know. Um, so anyway, uh, I began listening to his stories with much more interest. And um, uh, it seemed to me that uh, this whole idea of these kids having this wonderful summer interrupted by blood and mayhem would make a good graphic story. And I had been looking for one ever since Stitches was published. I'd been looking for another story. And uh, so I began, with Mike's full permission and encouragement, I began going back to my studio every day and drawing pictures that I saw in my mind from these episodes. And I wrote an outline for a story. And I sent it off to New York. And my agent, who's also a, a good editor of mine, and my editor uh, must have felt the, 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 the potentials in the plot and, and also my energy and my enthusiasm. Because uh, very soon, we were out of the starting gate, and I was off down the track. Um, I already had had a contract, by the way, which I had signed right after Stitches. They wanted another book from me. Um, and Bob, my good editor, had kept putting off uh, the deadline three times, I think, already by 2015 when I found this story. So it was already, you know, stretched out. There was the pressure of that. But um, uh, at any rate, I went along very swimmingly for about three months. And uh, then it occurred to me that things were not right. Something was something. 
There was something fraudulent about what I was doing. I couldn't quite pick, put my finger on it, but I didn't believe it. And my good agent, Holly, um, told me what the problem was. Uh, she said, David, the problem is you're not in it. This is not your voice. You're trying to imitate your friend Mike's voice, and it's not you. It's not working. It doesn't have any heart. I don't know what you're going to do about that, but uh, that's, that's what I'm telling you is wrong. So I went into a, I plunged into a depression for about two months. Uh, but at the same time, I've, I've made enough books to know um, that the thing to do is really just sort of wait and uh, hang on and wait for an opening. And then one day that opening came when I was uh, in conversation with a good friend of mine, Tobin Anderson, who's a marvelous, well-seasoned novelist. And Tobin said, uh, David, your agent's absolutely right. He said, the very best books always have something of the author in them. And if you're going to go that route, uh, you don't have to, but if you're going to go that route, it means you're going to probably have to confront the thing that scared you the most when you were that age. And I took that as a really nice, good challenge. Not nice, but good. Um, first of all, I don't mind scaring myself. And uh, second of all, I uh, had waded through the swamp of my childhood so it only made a kind of logical sense that I should enter the, let's call it the bog of my adolescence and, um, and see what happened there. And so I began changing things and I began, I took Mike out of the personality of my character, Russell, and I put in myself. And uh, although not many of the things that happen in the story ever happened really to me, I found that there was a lot of um, there were a lot of places where I could fit in. I'd been bullied severely in school. I had been an outsider, a loner, uh, sort of like Benny. Um, I uh, would have done anything when I was 13 to fit in with a group of my peers, and uh, even uh, to the point of betrayal. And all of that I started putting into the book. And the more I put in of myself, the more the thing began to gain in verisimilitude. And uh, all of that was good. But that wasn't the end of it, folks, because I went through at least uh, 12 full revisions over the course of three years, working every day day and night in my dreams. Um, I don't think I was a very easy person to live with during this period. <laughs> Sarah's just giving a gesture of assent there. Um, but uh, I got through it. Um, the last three or four revisions in involved um, some, uh, some real uh, dr drastic cuts. I cut out three ma major characters, including Benny, because I had been drawing away, the, drawing this character and, and the things that he was doing to animals. And while it was all very um, fascinating in a, in a dark way, it was taking away completely from what I sensed was the meat of the story now, which was the inner development of my character, Russell. I knew that was going to be much harder to illustrate, but I also knew that it was the right way to go. The animal murders continue in the book. They stayed there. But now, in the background, done anonymously by a faceless, nameless killer, they become a kind of a metaphor for something sick at the center of this especially this male society that Russell is trying to find his way in. And just as um, 10 years later, uh, from the time my story takes place, around 
1956. In 1966, I think it was, I may have that date slightly wrong, but uh, the Charles Manson killings would become a metaphor for uh, a society that had made a break for freedom that had gone completely off the rails. Just as school shootings today are uh, a national nightmare and symbolic of something wrong, very wrong in our society. And that felt right, it felt right. Um, my research on the book included talking to everybody I knew, uh, my male friends, about their experience in adolescence. Um, and I reaped some real rewards there, too. Uh, one good friend of mine from Minneapolis gave me that idea about the pliers at, that the bullies wield at school. Um, another close friend uh, described a very disturbing encounter that, encounter that he had had when he was 11 in a, with another guy in a bedroom, um, and which wasn't sexual, by the way, but which uh, stayed in his mind the rest of his life, wondering what was going on. It was a hugging, right? and that happens in my book. Um, so uh, all of that um, reshaped my friend's stories, and, uh, and it turned more into my own, my own story, my own book. Um, just in brief, for those who haven't read it, uh, when, as you see on the movie, when, when Russell's mom runs off at the very beginning, uh, his dad, who's a kind of a checked out alcoholic Korean vet, Korean War vet, um, decides to move him and Russell to California in search of some vague dream. Um, and there, almost immediately, as you saw, he's rejected by his own sister, um, with whom he thought he was going to live and build a new life. And that, then some other things right there at the beginning of the story, including what happens to that puppy in the, in the highway, establish a theme of rejection and abandonment and its consequences. Um, um, what else should I tell you? Uh, Dad uh, eventually on the GI Bill buys a cheap little house in, uh, in the housing development that, 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 there's, that are springing up like mushrooms all around Marshfield. My, that's the town I named Marshfield. Um, and uh, eventually Dad Although he gets a job teaching English at San Quentin, he stops coming home more and more, and he eventually disappears completely. Uh, we don't know exactly what happens, but uh, he just stops coming home. Such things happen in society to kids all the time. Um, so Russell is left to fend for himself in a rather cruel, indifferent world. Russell needs love, but Imitating his dad, trying to be a man, he rejects it every time he feels its approach. And this habit will have some really terrible consequences for another boy, for which uh, Russell's uh, complicity will be very hard to find an expiation for. So somebody asked me what readers can expect from this book. And I said that I hope that they might find themselves in it, no matter what their gender or race, ethnicity, because, ethnicity, because we all go through the same chaos around that age. It doesn't matter who we are. Um, and I hope that I've used a technique that will draw you in to that experience. I call my graphic work uh, slow film, which um, it's something, I don't think it's, it can't be totally original with me, but um, the fact is I've never been a comics reader. I read Pogo when I was young, you know, which was a wonderful 
wonderfully drawn, fanciful uh, thing by Walt Kelly, who came out of the Disney Studios in the 40s. But the cartoon, the, the strip was political. Uh, I didn't understand half of what I was reading. I loved the, the wordplay, the language, and so on, but uh, the politics were way over my head, and nobody discussed them with me. I did learn about the McCarthy hearings from that, uh, from the, from that strip. Um, aside from Pogo, though, and Mad Magazine when it first came out, and then later in the 60s, the first, the only uh, three copies of Zap Comics that ever came out, um, that was the extent of my reading in comics. Um, oh, and I also liked Uncle Scrooge diving into his pool of money. That, <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but uh, um, at any rate, I made a graphic novel in Stitches, and now I've made another one. And both of them, aside from using the panel, the sequence of panels that comics generally do, um, I don't do anything wild with my pictures. I don't do what a lot of contemporary comics do, the slicing and dicing of pictures. and dialogue that shoots and sparks from one side of the page to the other. You know what I'm talking about, comics readers, you. And uh, I'm I think that's because I'm more influenced by cinema than by comic books and um, more, interest, uh, more influenced specifically by the cinema of the middle 60s which was when movies started to get really good. Um, and the whole Hollywood thing began to be sloughed off. And more and more films in black and white started coming out of Europe by people like Bergman, Fellini, Antonioni. I intone their names like the names of the gods or the saints because they still are to me like saints. They taught me how to tell stories visually. Polanski should be added to that. Um, Hitchcock, of course, the master of them all, um, taught me how to tell stories visually, taught me how to create suspense and uh, all visually and all without the visual pyrotechnics that you see every time you go to the movies. Even if the movie you went to see doesn't contain them, the previews will. Uh, you know, the camera swirling around a figure, going up to the ceiling, going down to the floor, constantly moving, which is basically a diversion from the fact that the movie is a piece of shit <laughs> written by a committee. A committee. Um, you can still. Every once in a while, I'll find a good film coming along nowadays, but very rarely. So I constantly go back uh, and look at the films of um, the masters whom I admire. Even a bad movie by somebody like Roman Polanski is worth watching for the storytelling technique. Um, I would cite a film called Repulsion as being a film that's deeply flawed, which he's admitted, but which, if you can stand it, because it's very, it's terrifying is a brilliant piece of practically wordless storytelling that really gets to you. That said, a book is a book and a movie is a movie and never the twain shall meet. But I've found that in graphic books, the two can be incorporated in interesting ways and make for a new kind of experience. So I hope that you will like what I've done. Anybody got a question? Yes. I'm just curious. You, you talked about the rewriting. So when you rewrite, do you typically rewrite the dialogue and the graphics together? Yes. Do you find sometimes you'll just work with the graphics because you're not doing what the text is doing? You know, it might be interesting to know that I, I write out everything before I even begin to draw. I have to have that literary structure um, before I start a book or a scene. You know, in general, there's got to be that that uh, 
that basic structure we all know from reading fiction, you know, beginning, middle, and end. Theater is the same way. You know, it's, there's a certain structure we all react to that we all use in our storytelling. Um, and in terms of the rewriting, uh, sometimes, you know, if I've got the basic structure there, maybe I don't have to write out a scene entirely. Um, and also to your question, the pictures can lead you in different directions. Um, there's, uh, there's an immigrant couple in my story, a Chinese immigrant couple back in the 50s in California who are like almost everybody else in the story, like my hero um, and a few other characters, outsiders, uh, people rejected by society, people suspect, suspect because of their origins. Um, they just started out as incidental characters. But the moment I drew the old man, Mr. Ma, the moment I saw his face and saw him doing his Tai Chi in the back of their house on the patio, uh, the Tai Chi I got from my wife, Sarah, who has studied it for the last 18 years. And it's just such a fluid, slow, beautiful dance to watch. Um, the moment I saw him do it, the moment I drew him doing these things, I suddenly saw another example of, a, of masculinity that became very important in my book because the rest of the examples were hideous. Do I? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't think I do. I don't think I do. The drawings do that. And the drawings suggest, you know, um, that there's so much in a gesture about a person that can, that can suggest a whole other side to his personality that I never dreamed of when I was typing to begin with. It's an interesting question. I'm not an artist. <laughs> I'm more of an artist than I am of a writer. My writings, I save them for my archives because librarians love that stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd be, sort of, I'd be sort of embarrassed if they were ever published, I think. Anything else? Yes? Who? Did you share them? I shared, no, I shared them uh, with, my, with my agent, editor. Uh, and occasionally with my actual editor publisher, but there are differences in editors, and my agent Holly has strength in both language and art. She, her her uh, agency is mainly published, although it's changing now. She's mainly published picture books, and I've worked with her for as long as the agency has existed. But um, so she can read sequential pictures. My dear editor, Bob, his strengths are in language. He's a brilliant wordsmith. Um, and he's not so great with the pictures. He's one of these people who will say, now wait a minute. Is that the same woman that was back here two pages ago? And I'll say, yeah. And he say, well, what? she had a different hairstyle. Didn't her? Where's that earring? I say, Bob, this is a sketch. It's a sketch. I forgot the blasted <laughs> earring. Yeah. And so, you know, he's, he's limited that way. And so, actually, when I started working with him on stitches, I began drawing everything out almost to the finish so that there wouldn't be any interruption in Bob's experience of the book. <laughs> you know, it was his first time out, basically. Yeah, he, he, Bob has curated some great graphic novels, but he was never involved until then in the creation of one. So we all learned so much. Um, and there were some rough points, you know, but I think he's so different now. He says, have you shown this to Holly? <laughs> what does she think? <laughs> so, yes, yes. Uh, Uh, 
asking for a friend. friend. Oh, is there any, could there be a young writer? <laughs> um, what kind of advice are you talking about? What um, about writing? Be a reader. You learn to write by reading. I think I've never I've never taken a creative writing class. Um, I don't know. I I do miss knowing some grammatical rules, but I've learned. You know, once I started paying more attention, I I, I picked them up. You know, a comma usually comes before the word with. <laughs> I know that one, <laughs> um, but I never read Strunk and White all the way through. As for art, oh my God, get busy with life drawing. I think you know, even if you're gonna, even if you've got a, a crude style, life drawing is so important. Um, and I've, I've. Uh, that was, that's been my obsession ever since I was 21 and decided to go into art. Um, I wanted, above all, to learn to draw the human body from any position, uh, in, from any angle, um, from memory. And very, very difficult to do at first. Impossible, in fact. But I had some great life, life teachers at uh, the art schools I went to. They put us some, through some very rigorous exercises, one of which was uh, he'd put the model in one room, and then he'd make you go draw in the next room where you couldn't see her. <laughs> he'd say, go in there, spend as much time as you like, but you have to draw in here. <laughs> Impossible at first. You know. Now, many, many decades later, I can do that. I've kept my eyes open. and. Uh, and I know anatomy. I, anatomy is so important. It's just so important. Um, if you don't have anatomy, your figures aren't going to stand on the ground. You know, it's hard work. But if you want to do it, you know, if you if you're really interested, it's not work at all. It's pleasure. For me, it was a joy. Yeah. As for getting an agent, forget about it. Just. Be as good an artist, writer as you can. I would even recommend going the route that I did unconsciously. Get a few books published without one, and then see how you're treated financially. <laughs> You'll eventually, eventually an agent will find you if you're really good. That's what happened with me and Holly. She called me up, and uh, she turned out to be the best agent in New York. They call her the deal maker. <laughs> Fred, do you have a question? Well, I assume that you've got some of your trademark big and small perspectives. Perspective is another thing you need to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you, 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 you provoke me here. I always assumed that it might have been intuitive. But now you talk about the influence of the directors from the 60s movies. Uh, and I'm wondering how does that come into your being when you put these together. That all, that, you know, movie, movie directors are, uh, they're like composers. They are aware of rhythms and uh, story structure. And the best ones of them uh, never put anything superfluous into their film. You know, um, Hitchcock, the film may be going along, and suddenly the camera makes an odd move in on a telephone or something, and then it cuts away. But that just that few seconds of emphasis on that phone plants it in your mind, so that later on, when the telephone or whatever the object is becomes uh, critical to the plot, uh, you've been warned. You didn't even know it, you know. Um, they're masters at this. I don't know how they do it with actual people on a set, and uh, and that you know. But I can do that on paper, so I have that gift, and I feel grateful to them. Um, Antonioni, whom not many people like or watch, um, he made a movie called La Ventura, the adventure with uh, Monica Vitti, which. Um, I noticed of all the zillions of films listed in, uh, on Netflix, 
gets a rare five star, which surprises me because hardly anybody's seen it. And if they've seen it, they probably turned it off after 15 or 20 minutes, um, realizing that the slow pace of the film wasn't going to let up. Um, but he does things with a camera in that film. It starts out on an island where these, uh, this, these rich uh, friends have gone to frolic for an afternoon on this island off the coast of Italy. And, uh, and a girl disappears, a young lady disappears. And they spend the rest of, of a couple of days looking for her. And the odd juxtapositions of the characters one shot stays in my mind particularly with Monica Vitti in the, in the foreground. She's the heroine of the film. And behind her comes this man. And he, he's small in the background. And he gets larger. But, he's seen, but the way the camera is posed, it looks like he's growing out of, her, out of her head. And that becomes significant later on because she has an affair with him. And she has, in fact, completely made him up as to who he is. He's a, he's a schmuck. He's a good-looking schmuck. And she's looking for romance, and she picks the wrong guy. But that shot, when you see it, it just looks weird. It doesn't mean anything, but it gets into your brain later on as the film progresses. You suddenly understand this was a visual clue to her whole relationship. It's amazing. And there are you know, probably 25 or 30 amazing shots just in that beginning sequence that tell stories like that. Um, that's what I admire about film. Certain things you can't do with, you know, film can do that you can't do in a book. You can't zoom across something. You, can't, you don't have any music, um, so on. By the way, the music in this little film this is by Julia Kent. This was the music I listened to almost all three years when I was making the book. This dark, driven cello uh, um, fit perfectly with my Russell, because Russell is constantly running away from his problems. He's constantly biking off into the distance. And um, I was so lucky. Uh, when we made the film, we were just going to use her music without asking. <laughs> but one day, Gary called me up and he says, uh, David, I'm getting cold feet. He said, this, this woman is all over YouTube, and she's going to know in five minutes if we steal, steal her music. And I said, well, what do we do? It's perfect music. He said, I agree. But you've got two choices. You either find something else, or you write her and ask permission for us to use it. So I um, immediately had, for an entire day, a bad case of diarrhea while I wrote a letter to her. <laughs> and I sent it off, and I waited, and I waited. And three days later, I got this email back from Julia Kent. And she said, I would love it if you used my music in your film. She watched the Stitches film, where I'd used the music of somebody else, so she knew. And I sent her a book. and. Um, um, and um, a couple of weeks ago, when we knew I was going to appear at this Barnes & Noble in, Man in Manhattan, um, Barnes & Noble wanted me to be on stage with another graphic novelist. And I said, why? And they, uh, they, were, they were talking through my publicist. So um, he said, that's just the way they want it, David. This is a book-selling event, so you know, pick somebody, and we'll so as I was trying to think who I might want to have dilute my program, <laughs> I, I suddenly thought, wait a minute. Julia Kent lives in Manhattan. And I wrote her, and I said, oh, and by the way, she has one cello. All that music is just her on stage. She comes out. She's dressed in black. Her cello is black. And she's barefoot. And as she plays, as she begins to play, she uses her bare right toes to manipulate this little mechanism on the floor, 
which allows her to play a section of music and then loop it. And then she plays over it. And she keeps manipulating and adding and subtracting. And pretty soon she gets this sound like that you heard of a, of a cello quintet. And uh, it's just amazing. So I wrote her and I said, how would you like to be on stage with me at Barnes & Noble on Monday the 17th? She wrote back. She said, I'd love it. And I said, the hurricane's coming. How are you going to get your cello uptown? On the subway? Do you need help? She said, I'll manage. And she showed up. And it was a wonderful evening of art and literature and film and music that uh, I wish more people had been there. But um, the hurricane was on its way. There was an air of apocalypse all over the East Coast. And for some reason, no one, nobody wanted to buy a book to read while they're swirling around in the air. <laughs> I don't get it, but they didn't show up. You know. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Um, how long have you been spending time in Mexico? And do you do most of your work now in Mexico or here in Michigan? I work. Make a oh, yes, it makes a big difference. Uh, the elevation, for one thing, it's uh, over a mile up. Uh, which is great for Sarah's asthma. Sarah's a writer, but Sarah is also a gardener, and Sarah also has two houses to take care of because I am the least practical person on earth, and we have a we have a lot of land and a couple of places out in the country. So that's where Sarah gets most of her writing done. Concentrator, she writes every day in her journal and makes notes and so on. But there she can write every day in Mexico. And I, I just pack up my studio because I work all the time. And I just take my stuff down there. And I have uh, stuff that I leave there with my friend Mike. And um, so I'm, I make myself happy. And um, the, 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 the elevation, the air, the spring-like weather all year round, but especially Mexico, the people, the color, like you wouldn't believe, the, the, and the people. The, this is rural Mexico. It's not urban Mexico. And these are good family, religious people, family-oriented people. Everything's changing, of course, with the Canadians and the Americans moving up. And the property has gone sky high, but the Mexican people are the same. Um, I don't know much Spanish, I'm ashamed to say. Every time I try to learn it, the only thing that comes out is French. And nobody speaks that down there. But uh, uh, they're very kind and forgiving. And everybody speaks a little English. You know, you can order your breakfast, no problem. How long have you been there? 25 years. Yeah. When you're working out your your illustrations. Um, I know you use, you're very loose and gestural in your, yeah. your drawings. So do you work on a large format or a smaller, or do you, do you work in a size that is going to be the size of the printed edition? This is the size I work in. Yeah, which is roughly the size of the book. They did, uh, at the end, they they made it a slightly smaller trim size because at 400 pages, it became a real weight. You know, it's like a cement block, actually, uh, because the paper they chose is very nice. Um, not, you know, it's not tissue paper. It's, it's, a, it's a paper that takes a wash uh, very nicely. Anyway, they, uh, yeah, I worked to size. I learned early on in my career, before computers even existed, before they became the great tool of designers, um, I learned to work to size because I didn't want any surprises when I saw the printed book. Nowadays, it's not that necessary. You can work any size you want. Uh, but I do not use a computer at all. Um, I might. Uh, Oh, the, 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 the designers do. All the printing in the book, which you'll see if you look at it, uh, is made from a font that was made from my writing. So it looks like my writing. Um, but, you know, and they do a little cleanup and so on. 
But other than that, there are no computers involved in what I do. I just don't like working on a screen. I like to get messy. I like ink in my fingers and under my nails and uh, the feel of chalk and uh, watercolors. And since I trained as a printmaker, um, I learned that I learned to get a mark right the first time. I do like a sketchy look, you know, and, a, and as you say, a very gestural kind of drawing, which is exaggerated on this film, by the way, because my panels are blown up screen size. Uh, the art in the book looks much more refined, but it's still loose. But I, um, that printmaking background where you etch a line and it's there, you know, unless you want to spend two weeks scraping it away, <laughs> you'll learn to get it right the first time <laughs> with practice. Hey, well, a couple more Bertie, questions. Bertie. Your characters in, in the book, are they from memory or are they based from someone you know? Um, Mike, my friend with the handlebar mustache and the belly and the scraggly hair and the baggy jeans, who's 73 now, when he was a kid, he looked like Leonardo DiCaprio. And his son looks like that now, just one of the most gorgeous young men I've ever laid eyes on. And I decided that was when, you know, in those early stages when I was developing Russell, he was Mike. So he looks a little DiCaprio esque, Prio esque. But um, even when I changed him to me, I was fine with that look. <laughs> 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 um, and you know, I might have, I don't know if I ever did this with Leonardo's face, but I might have, I did use a, I do use a computer, I, I lied. The computer is such a great research tool. You know, just punch in DiCaprio photos, and there you get six pages of Leonardo's face. I did that with the character of Mr. Ma, because, and, uh, uh, because I wasn't that familiar with uh, the Chinese physiognomy, and I didn't want to insult anybody, and, um, uh, and so on. Uh, a bike. I wanted a, I wanted a specific kind of Schwinn bike. I found a thousand pictures of them on, on, the, on the web. Um, but still, you know, you can have a photo of something, but when you need to make that bike turn a corner with a kid on it, you don't have no photos. You know, you gotta, you've got to do that from memory, and you've got to remember with your body how when you press down with your right foot, the bike goes this way, and on the left, this way, and there's your clue suddenly. You rem you have got, you've got a body memory that um, gives it to you, and so on. Yes, let me get... So you said that you went through 12 versions. Um, how do you know, when you're writing a story, how do you know to keep going through versions, and how do you know when to give up on that story? <laughs> which, is also to, which is also to ask, how do you know when you got it, right? I know I've got it when it, make, when it chokes me up. Uh, it's quite simple. Um, I didn't know how this book was going to end until I got to the last page. I had no idea when I turned that page what was going to happen. It could have gone five different ways. And when I hit on that ending, I choked up and I teared up and I knew this is it. It's got, it's got the perfect irresolute resolution that I was looking for. Um, how do you keep going? Well, a contract helps <laughs> <laughs> to be crude about it. If I had never done this book, I would have owed my publisher a lot of money. <laughs> uh, you know, the th little things like that drive you on. <laughs> but also just the love of drawing and the love of creating, too. It's a, it's a privilege to have this as a career. It's a privilege. Most people go to work hating their job and the people they work with. I know uh, I used to feel that way when I had jobs. I was a terrible employee. 
But when I got to art, I suddenly knew I was on to something. I can do this. I can do it. I haven't always found a lot of good stories to tell. That's why most of my picture books have been other people's stories. But even there, I have to find something that rings true. It may not be in the details, but it, in the overall uh, you know, theme or the characters, something grabs me and keeps me going. And it had better because a picture book takes a long time to make. Even a 32-page one can take at least a year out of your life. And you're going to be reading that story every damn day. <laughs> you better like it. <laughs> um, you had a question, didn't you? Okay. I thought the puppy had a lot of emotion. Do you have a pet? I don't at the time. I love animals, and I have had dogs and cats, but Sarah and I... Uh, we live out in the country. It's harder and harder to find people to take care of your house and your pets when you go away. And we're gone so much of the time, it wouldn't be fair. But yeah, we used to have giant Airedales and always had a cat until last year when Mabel died. Um, I really love animals. I do a very cruel thing to this dog, you'll see. But uh, I shouldn't tell you. But it sets the theme of rejection and abandonment and what happens. <laughs> Some people, st <laughs> I was telling Fred, my doctor came to my last book signing and he bought a copy of my book. My doctor. And I saw him the other day and he said, David, I've been reading your book in fits and starts. I could hardly get past that puppy. <laughs> But one, one, one last, more. One, one, one last remark. One last remark. I'm a contrarian. And you know, one of the basic rules of writing a great screenplay, a great selling screenplay, is always save the cat or <laughs> save the puppy. And I broke that rule immediately and threw it out the window. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Let's all give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. So, you know, I've, I've always considered David one of the greatest filmless directors. I mean, those books are just like cinema. So please honor his work um, and support our local bookseller, uh, Dean, back here at Michigan News, by buying a copy of this great book. And uh, David will be in the back signing books for us. And uh, thank you very much for coming, and we hope to see you again very soon.